from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Kai Bird is a friend of mine, a fairly recent vintage, but we lived about a mile each other from each other for much of each of the past three years in Lima, Peru. Um, we have a good view of the Atlantic, of the Pacific Ocean. Kai had an even better one. Um, it's been our remarkable good fortune this year to have two exceptionally good books uh, published about spies. Um, ben McIntyre's um, A Spy Among Friends is the story um, of um, Kim Philby, the, the, the British uh, citizen who betrayed not merely his country but the entire Western alliance to the Soviet Union. Uh, Kim Philby was the bad spy. Um, the good spy was Robert Ames, the, which is the title of, of Kai's extraordinary book. It tells a story that was first made, fam made familiar to a number of readers by my Washington Post colleague David Ignatius in his wonderful novel, Agents of Innocence. As David has said, Kai has found out so much more about the story, of, uh, the extraordinary story of Robert Ames than, than David himself was ab ever able to learn. Uh, I leave you in th the very capable hands of Kai Bird. Thank you, it's really great to be here and to see John. Tomorrow he promises to make me a good Peruvian Pisco sour. <laughs> um, and, and yes, I, my new book is called The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames. And uh, he's not to be confused with Aldrich Ames, who is the bad spy, the other bad spy being Kim Philby, but uh, Ames was a completely unknown character. Uh, he joined the CIA in 1960 and was a clandestine officer, a man who recruited agents. Uh, he was a very good Arabist. He had posts in Dahran, Beirut, uh, Aden, Tehran, Kuwait, uh, and he, unlike many CIA officers in the sort of the stereotype that we have, uh, you know, when the agency was created in 1948, it was largely populated by uh, blue bloods from Yale and Harvard and members of Skull and Bones, the secret societies at Yale. And, but Robert Ames came from a simple working class background. His father was a steel worker in Philadelphia. And he was a basketball star, tall, six, six foot three, handsome guy. And uh, he had none of that sort of sophisticated aristocratic background. Uh, he was very much a sort of Jimmy Stewart kind of all-American character. And I know this because he was my next door neighbor when I was 11, 12, and 13 years old in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, where my father was a foreign service officer and Ames was posted as his first um, posting abroad as a clandestine CIA officer. Of course, at the age of 13, I had no idea he was a spy. But my father, who actually should be here in the room someplace, is now 89, and at one point he, he confessed to me that Bob was actually a CIA officer. Um, and he had an extraordinary career. Inside the CIA, he is a legend for having penetrated the PLO in 1969, very early and creating a friendship relationship with uh, Yasser Arafat's uh, intelligence chief and chief bodyguard, a young man named Ali Hassan Salame. And this friendship lasted for 10 years until Ali Hassan was assassinated by Israeli Mossad agents in Beirut in 1979. And then Ames himself died in Beirut in 1983 in the first big truck bomb attack on a U.S. embassy. Eight CIA officers were killed that day, uh, and a total of 17 Americans and 40-odd more Lebanese civilians who happened to be walking by or applying for visas. And 
dozens of people were severely wounded and survived, including Anne Demerell, who I see is sitting here in the audience, who had, I think, 19 broken bones and numerous surgeries. And, I mean, it was a terrible event. Um, usually I talk more about the whole book and sort of give you a synopsis of it, but today I'm, I'd like to sort of describe what it's like to try to write a spy book. Um, initially, I was not intending, I didn't think I could write a real biography uh, of a clandestine CIA officer. Who's going to talk to me? Uh, where were the sources? Everything seemed to be classified. Um, so <clears throat> initially, I stumbled upon this idea, well, I'll, I'll do a book about the embassy bombing, which is largely forgotten. People sort of remember the Beirut, em the Beirut uh, uh, Marine barracks attack, where a truck bomb killed 241 Marines. But that took place in October 83, and the embassy bombing occurred six months before that in April. And it's been large, largely forgotten. And uh, I started out th with this book on, on a whim. I Googled Robert Ames's name. And up came a court case referencing a 2003 civil suit filed by Anne Demerell and Yvonne Ames, the widow of Robert Ames, in federal district court here in DC. And on my computer screen, sitting in Lima, Peru, where I was living at the time, uh, came this court records, very detailed testimony of, uh, by Yvonne Ames and her six children, um, very moving documentation of what happened that day in Beirut how all these people had lost their lives. And I thought, well, this is very vivid material. I can, you know, if I can't do a biography about Robert Ames, I can sort of do a history of the bombing and focus on him as one of the chief characters. So the first thing I did at, after deciding to engage on this book was to um, fly up here to Langley, Virginia, to the CIA headquarters. And I explained what I wanted to do write a biography of one of their great heroes. And I walked into the lobby there where there's a wall of stars, one of whom represented Robert Ames. Each star represents a fallen CIA officer. And they checked me through security. I had to surrender my cell phone. And then I went up to see George Little, then the public affairs officer for the CIA. And I explained to him, you know, that I was a biographer. He, he sort of knew, knew who I was. But I wanted to do this bio biography, but really a, a history of the embassy bombing. And all I asked for was a chance to maybe sit down with an in-house historian and go over some check my facts and the chronology and get the right job titles that Ames had during his career and things like that. And, and George said, oh, this sounds like a plausible thing. Maybe we can arrange to do this. And, and then on my way out, I, I said, you know, to try to emphasize how, how much research I was already involved in, I, I reached into my backpack and pulled out an iPad and said, here, let me show you the pictures I've, I've uh, found already. And George kind of blanched. Apparently, I had broken CIA security by bringing in an iPad. <laughs> uh, but he, he nevertheless allowed me to uh, show him a few of the pictures that I had already found of Bob Ames. And, and indeed, by that time, I had found Yvonne, the widow. And I'd flown down to a small town in North Carolina where she lives in very simple circumstances in an old farmhouse. And I spent a day and a half with her interviewing her, seeing her family album. She gave me some of these photographs. And we had a great interview. She, she remembered me from when I was 13, but we hadn't seen each other since then, from our days in Arabia. 
And in the course of the interview, she mentioned at one point that she thought maybe there were some letters that Bob had written to her over the years. She didn't know where they were anymore, but maybe in a suitcase someplace in the attic of her, where her daughter lived nearby. And I said, wow, you know, that might be something worth looking for. <laughs> you know, this is the biographer's uh, best dream and worst nightmare, that there are letters out there that would be allow you to write in an authentic way about your subject, and the nightmare is that you never find them. Uh, so I, I spent six months thereafter sort of gently sending emails to Yvonne, encouraging her to find those letters, and it, eventually, after six months, she did indeed uh, find them in an attic in a proverbial trunk. And uh, there are 150 pages of handwritten letters that Bob had sent to her during his various postings abroad when he was sort of on short-term duty and she was still in, living in, in rest in Virginia. And the letters were sometimes mundane, family letters, greetings, queries about their six children. But he also wrote about his work. And he did so in a really personal way, describing his daily routine. Sometimes how much, you know, he complained about how much he had to write. So you sort of learn that an intelligence officer, every time he has a meeting, he has to record what was said by everyone in great detail. This takes, you know, a lot of time. Uh, Ames described some of his meetings with agents in Beirut. Uh, he described his uh, dinners every other night when he was in Beirut uh, with Ali Hassan Salama. Yeah, he was, you know, the old saying in intelligence is if you sup with the devil, you should use a very long spoon. Well, Ames is the kind of empathetic character who knew how to listen knew how to make people feel comfortable, and he supped with the devil with a very short spoon. He got very close to Ali Hassan Salama. He uh, had dinner with him. He got to know his wife and his kids. And when Ames uh, learned in the 1976 that Ali Hassan was thinking of taking on as a Muslim a second wife, he was squiring around the Beirut nightclubs, a beautiful young woman who just happened to be Miss Universe of 1971. A gorgeous woman, Lebanese Maronite, and he had fallen in love with Georgina Rizik, and Bob Ames disapproved. And in one of his letters to Yvonne, he writes, I don't understand what Ali sees in that woman. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it was, it was great material in these letters, and it made me, I knew then that I could actually write a biography. Uh, and I then proceeded to try to find, you know, I, I, I'd asked for cooperation from the CIA, and I hadn't heard from them. They had never set up a meeting with one of their in-house historians, as I had requested. Uh, I wrote personal emails to the director, um, and I never heard back. They never answered. I never got any cooperation from the agency to write this book about one of their heroes. But I gradually found retired CIA intelligence officers who one by one agreed to see me, initially off the record. I wasn't allowed to use their name. Um, and they would talk to me and then refer me to other friends. And eventually I interviewed over 40 retired CIA officers. And all of these guys had signed secrecy oaths. And they all wanted desperately to tell me their secrets. They were 30, 40-year-old secrets. There were nothing that was going to harm national security, and they wanted to talk about their good friend, Bob Ames. 
Daddy, you finally made it. <laughs> so this is the man who confirmed to me in the first instance that Bob Ames was actually a spy and not a foreign service officer. Um, but as I was saying, the, the, the CIA officers were eager to tell me their stories. And uh, yes, they were divulging secrets, but they were all 30 and 40 year old secrets. And they wanted to tell me these secrets for very honorable reasons. They wanted you as citizens to know the story, and to know the history. Um, anyway, it was great. It was a lot of fun talking to these old spooks. Um, and at one point, at one point I was told, of course, uh, Jonathan Yardley mentioned that one of his colleagues at the Washington Post, David Ignatius, had written, published a book, a novel called Agents of Innocence in 1987. And so, of course, and the book, everyone told me was based on the Robert Ames story, but it was a novel. But I, when I was starting out, I went to see Ignatius, and I wanted to feel him out and get his opinion about whether he thought this biography was feasible or not. And I knew he had sources in the CIA and retired sources, but also active intelligence officers who might have known Ames. And he, I'm very grateful. He encouraged me to do this. He said, yes, it's possible, and it's a great story. And he wanted to tell the story as nonfiction, as a reporter. Um, but in the 1980s, he thought it was too early, and no one would talk to him, and it was, everything was too sensitive. Um, and he very graciously gave me some names that helped to get me started on finding some of these retired spooks. And he also told me, well, you know, a key source is a young Lebanese businessman that Ames met in 1969 named Mustafa Zain. And he said, I don't know where Mustafa is now, but if you're going to tell the Bob Ames story, you really have to find Mustafa. But he's kind of elusive and He's a difficult personality, and I don't know if, if I could find him, I don't know if I would go to see him today. <laughs> it was sort of a warning. Uh, but I nevertheless, every time I had an interview with one of my CIA sources, I would say, hey, you know, have you ever heard of Mustafa Zain? Do you know where he's hanging out these days? Is he still alive? And at one point I got wind that he was in Florida. I got his address, and I got one of my retired spooks who lived in Florida to go and knock on the door. And it turned out to be he'd moved on. It was the wrong address, a dead end. M many months later, at a point where I had actually, I was close to having a full draft of my, my a first draft of my book. I got a message from uh, another spook who said, here is a number that I'm told is Mustafa Zain's cell phone. You can try calling him. So here I am sitting in Lima, Peru, and I get on my computer and I do a cold call on Skype to a cell phone in somewhere in the Middle East. And the phone rings and, it, and it, it, it's picked up and, and it's Mustafa Zain. And I explain what I'm doing, that I'm trying to write a biography of Robert Ames. And the first question Mustafa has is, how did you get this number? <laughs> <laughs> Only certain people have this number. <laughs> and I explain, well, I can't tell you, Mustafa, who gave me this number, but it's a mutual friend. <laughs> Uh, and so he then said, well, I've been waiting for 30 years for you to call. And I, <clears throat> he gave me his email. And for the next 
week, we emailed each other furiously back and forth, and Mustafa had lots of stories he was eager to tell. A few months later, I flew out to the Middle East, went to Amman, and I spent eight days, 10 hours a day, listening to Mustafa. It was like, I sort of like to think of it as a debriefing <laughs> in an intelligence fashion. Um, I took notes, I didn't record him because I thought that would make him nervous. Um, but I filled notebook after notebook and he turned out to be one of those great sources because he, he was then 71 years old but he had a great memory and he was a good storyteller. At times such a good storyteller that I sort of wondered, well, is he embellishing things? And, uh, and I knew I had to be careful with some of this. And so when I got back, I had to check every story with my other CIA sources. And, you know, it turned out Mustafa, Mustafa's stories all checked out. He also had letters that Bob Ames had written to him. Um, some of them ex extremely dramatic letters about a crucial moment in his relationship with Ali Hassan Salama, the PLO intelligence chief, where the relationship had broken down at, in the wake of the terrible massacre at the Munich Olympics carried out by Black September, a, a wing of Al Fatta. And Bob Ames thought that maybe Ali Hassan Salame had been involved in the, the Munich operation in which 11 Israeli athletes were tragically murdered. So the letters, you know, were, they gave you a window into sort of, again, how an intelligence officer thinks and operates. Uh, and if you read the book, you'll get a you you, you get an understanding that that CIA officers are not, not James Bond, and Bob Ames was no James Bond. He did occasionally have to carry a gun, but he hated guns. He never killed anyone. Uh, in one of his letters to Yvonne, his wife, he he was in Aden at the time, operating in the midst of a civil war, and people were getting assassinated in the streets, and his CIA station chief told him he had to take his pistol, and he just disobeyed the order and wrote to Ivan that, you know, if, I, <clears throat> if I'm going to be shot, it's going to be shot, I'll be shot from behind, I'll never see the bullet coming, there'll never be an opportunity to use this silly pistol anyway, so I'm not, use, <laughs> not carrying it around. Um, anyway, he was a very empathetic man. He, and that was why he was a good spy, why he was good at his work. Um, I don't want to go on too long here. Uh, anyway, after seeing Mustafa, Zain, and Amman, I, I then had to spend a, 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 about 10 days, two weeks in Israel, trying to track down some Mossad officers who may have known Bob Ames, and indeed I found four. And they remembered him, they knew exactly who he was, they knew that he was the back channel, he had created this very secret back channel to the PLO through Ali Hassan Salame. And that was a disturbing revelation to them in the 1970s because Henry Kissinger had promised the Israelis that we wouldn't have any dealings with this terrorist organization. But of course, I'd learned from my CIA officers that this is exactly what intelligence officers are supposed to do. They go where foreign service officers can't. And they go to dangerous neighborhoods and talk to bad guys. Bad guys like Ali Hassan Salama, who, you know, choose your label, he was a terrorist, he was a professional revolutionary, he was a freedom fighter for the Palestinian cause, but uh, he was someone that no U.S. diplomat could talk to. But Ames could, and he created this back channel that actually inside the agency today, everyone gives him credit for starting 
the Oslo peace process, starting to get Americans talking to the Palestinians, getting Americans to try to persuade, actually rather successfully, to think about achieving Palestinian aspirations without the gun, with a compromise, a two-state solution. And of course, the tragedy is that we're this many years later, 31 years after Bob Ames was killed in Beirut, the peace process is still at a stalemate. Um, writing this book, researching it was a lot of fun, but uh, when I announced to my wife, Susan, that I had to fly off to the Middle East for a month to do research, she was a little worried. And um, I assured her that, you know, there was no problem, it would be a piece of cake. And, uh, and indeed, when I got to Beirut, where I had a whole series of interviews lined up, and I had scheduled some time for myself in some of the newspaper archives of, Be of leading Beirut newspapers, I landed in around noon and, and checked into the Mayflower Hotel, which is the hotel that uh, Bob Ames himself checked into and spent his last night before he was killed on April 18th, 1983. And it's a lovely little boutique hotel in Ross Bay Root. And I got to see the room where he, he had spent his last night. And then I went for a stroll down the Corniche along the sea so, seashore. And Beirut looked fabulous. It had been rebuilt. This part of the city had been rebuilt since the terrible civil war that had taken over 150,000 lives over 15 years. Um, and I walked along the Corniche towards the spot where the US Embassy used to stand. It had been completely destroyed by this 2,000 pound truck bomb. Um, and Beirut looked fabulous. It, it had seaside restaurants along the Corniche. It, it, it looked like a very livable place. And I was thinking to myself, oh, you know, I should tell Susan we should maybe think about spending a vacation here or maybe even move here for a year or two. It'd be a nice place to live and work. I got back to my hotel in the Mayflower two hours later, and I turned on the television, and there was CNN reporting about a car bomb that had gone off a mile away in Beirut and had killed eight people, including the chief of intelligence who was investigating the assassination of Hariri, the prime minister who had been killed in 2005. So I quickly <clears throat> opened my laptop and wrote an email to Susan saying, don't worry, the bomb ha a a a exploded a mile away from me. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and she immediately calls me on her, her cell phone and says, what bomb? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, it was a sad reminder that Beirut is still, alas, a very dangerous place very troubled part of the world. And uh, it, it reminded me that the book that I was trying to write and finish at that point was a very relevant subject. But having almost finished, after speaking to Mustafa Zain, I had to rush back to Lima, Peru, and spend the next six months completely rewriting the book because of what Mustafa told me, um, which is a good thing. Uh, and when the book finally came out, it was greeted with some really great reviews and a an official denial from the CIA <laughs> regarding the end story in the book, which was, you know, I actually, to my surprise, with Mustafa's help and the help of some of my CIA sources, um, and a lot of sort of just plain detective work, I managed to put together a really 
fairly high iron cast story of how the Beirut embassy bombing had occurred. It wasn't, you know, it was, a, the, it was the first suicide truck bomb attack on a U.S. embassy, and when it happened, it was a mystery about who had done it. Um, and over the years, the presumption was that Hezbollah had done it, but in fact, Hezbollah didn't really exist until 1985. Um, but at the end of the book, I revealed that it was actually an act of state terrorism carried out by the Islamic Republic of Iran in the form of uh, a, an intelligence operation carried out by some of their Iranian Revolutionary Guard officers stationed in the Bekaa Valley who had been uh, sent there in the wake of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. And I name the commander of that Iranian Revolutionary Guard post in Lebanon, and I name his intelligence officer. And the surprising thing, the shocking thing that I learned in the end was that one of the, one of the masterminds of the truck bomb attack was this in Iranian intelligence officer who rose to become deputy defense minister in Iran and then defected in 2007 and at one point was debriefed here outside of Washington in a CIA safe house. And he is still alive and well and living maybe in America, maybe in Europe someplace, we're not quite sure. But the CIA, when the book came out, issued a statement, a tweet saying that we categorically deny that we had anything to do with arranging the defection of Ali Reza Asghari. So the book ends on a sort of classic intelligence dilemma. Um, you're dealing with bad guys and you want to get information that they have. And sometimes, even if they've killed eight CIA officers, you end up giving them haven in this country. It's a shocking story to me, but also a classic intelligence story. This is, you know, this, this happens in this world. Anyway, I, I hope you all get a chance to read The Good Spy and understand that it will give you not only a lot of history about the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli conflict, sadly, but also a sort of window into this world of intelligence. And I want to stop now, and we have time for at least 10 minutes of questions, I think, so fire away. I got a question. Um, as a nation writer, I salute you for your work. Uh, fellow nation writer, thank you. Uh, I, I, one of the amazing things I, I thought about the book when I read it was President Reagan's criti cri criticism of Israel during their, in their invasion. And uh, he was a president I always had a lot of contempt for. And uh, it was surprising to me what he did at that time, and particularly in contrast to what has happened recently in Gaza and the, I consider the silence of a president that I voted for. And uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Mr. Ames' uh, relationship with President Reagan and how he sort of influenced that critique. Sure. Oh, that's a great time. question. Um, as I said, Ames started out on the clandestine side as a clandestine CIA officer who recruits agents and such. And he rose very high up inside the agency in that field on the covert side. But he got bored with it and frustrated with the business of recruiting agents. And he was, he was a very intellectual fellow. He was criticized, in fact, by his colleagues for being too intellectual. Uh, he read a lot of books on the Middle East. He loved the history. He loved the language. He really learned the language. And uh, so at one point in his career, he jumped at the chance to flip to the other side, to the analytical side. So by the time Reagan became president in 1981, Robert Ames was chief of the whole analytical division for the Middle East and South Asia. And in that capacity, he was the guy to brief the president on 
anything to do with the Middle East, and he would do so often in the Oval Office or up in Camp David. And in the wake of the Israeli invasion in 1982, where you recall the Israelis under General Sharon, Ariel Sharon, uh, initially walked into southern Lebanon and then suddenly pushed all the way to the gates of Beirut and besieged the city um, and attempted eventually successfully to expel the PLO from Beirut. Uh, in the wake of that invasion, uh, Ronald Reagan was being briefed by Ames and he took the opportunity to sort of persuade Reagan and his new Secretary of State, George Shultz, to sign on to a peace plan. The first official American initiative to say, well, here's our notion of what should happen in a sort of final peace settlement. Let's try to settle this, this conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the rest of the Arab world. And it was a... Uh, 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 called the Reagan Peace Plan Initiative, um, unveiled by Reagan himself in a speech on September 1st, 1982, and Ames was basically the ghostwriter for it. And it was uh, inching towards a, a two-state solution. Um, so Reagan had, as the questioner suggested, a an understanding that this festering problem was a threat to U.S. national security and that peace was the, in the interest of, of the United States. And he attempted to get the Israelis to withdraw from Lebanon and to honor the commitments they had made in the Camp David Accords with regard to settlements in the West Bank. But you know, after Ames was killed in 83, just six months after the Reagan Peace Initiative, uh, Ames was the only person that, Aim that Reagan knew personally who had died in the bombing. And he was devastated. You can see this from his diary notes. And then six months later with the Marine barracks where another truck bomb rolled in and killed 241 US servicemen, Reagan gave up. He withdrew with the troops. He lost interest in pushing uh, his Middle East peace plan, and everything began to fall apart in retrospect, I believe. I didn't think I was going to have a question, but I do. Um, where to start? So. 30-some years ago, um, you sent me down to pick up some Freedom of Information Act uh, documents. <laughs> not, not from Langley, but uh, somewhere in Northern Virginia. I don't remember where. S Steve and was a Nation Magazine intern working for me at the time, and so I was... Say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an unsuccessful protege of Kai <laughs> Um So... Um, I remember looking through these documents and coming across a report from 1963 or 1964 that was an internal memo that someone in the CIA wrote to someone else in the CIA about how the Castro regime was going to implode of its own uh, corruption and, uh, and wait any day now and that the United States didn't need to do anything, that the Cuban government was going to just fall apart of its own accord. This was five or six years after the revolution. And I mention that now because I know you've done a lot of thinking over the years about intelligence and the intelligence community, and I'm wondering, in the post-2001 uh, world, uh, and thinking about the U.S. role in Iraq and Afghanistan and the way that the agency and the intelligence world has changed, uh, since then, to what extent are we getting good intelligence and to what extent are people within the intelligence community passing disinformation to themselves to justify a point of view that they already want to promote, such as 
invading a country on the basis of um, weapons of mass destruction that don't exist? Okay, well, <clears throat> that's a difficult question. Um, actually, I'll answer it by telling you, giving you a quote, as far as I can paraphrase it, from one of my CIA sources who um, explained that when he was a young man in the clandestine services, he was, you know, uh, mesmerized by all the secrets he had access to, all this privileged intelligence. It was, you know, it gave him a rush. Uh, and learning more and more secrets was, you know, it's fun to be on the inside. And you think you have special knowledge. But then he explained to me that, you know, over the years, and he says this is true of all intelligence officers, over the years they, they become a little more cynical and skeptical about this special knowledge. And they realize a lot of it's not so special. Um, they think initially that, well, if I can just get the right, write the right kind of memo, get access to the policymaker in the right moment, my special knowledge can persuade the policymaker, the politicians, to arrive at a better policy. But over the years, they become very cynical, and they suddenly realize that U.S. foreign policy is not fact-based. <laughs> that, in fact, none of the secrets, some of, none of the special knowledge they have makes any difference, that the policymakers rarely listen. Uh, and I, I think this is, this is not a self-serving sentiment. A lot of the people I interviewed expressed to me their enormous frustrations with the fact that they they know that U.S. policy in X, Y, or Z is on the wrong road, but they have no ability to change it. And the CIA in particular, from its founding, it was actually a liberal haven during the McCarthy era in the early 50s when McCarthy was going after State Department foreign service officers and destroying their careers, the CIA was protected because it's a secret intelligence agency. They, they didn't allow Senator McCarthy to question their men. And a lot of them were, were liberals who had a good sense. In fact, I, I interviewed people who, for some of my previous books about the Bundy brothers who got us into the Vietnam War, the CIA was actually often giving good intelligence about what a disaster it would be to turn this conflict in Vietnam into a ground war, that we'd end up doing the same thing that the French did in the 50s. Um, so the, the lesson I learned, uh, if anything, from writing The Good Spy is that, yes, there are secrets, but um, they're often wasted, and um, many of these secrets belong in the pages of the Washington Post and New York Times, and we'd all be better off if we had fewer secrets and more knowledge available to the public. I found Mustafa Zain such an interesting character. Are you still in touch with him? What is he doing? Is he going to write a book of his own? <laughs> Uh, I am still in touch with Mustafa, and he's a lovely man. He's, uh, you know, in his mid-70s now, and uh, he has written an unpublished personal memoir just for his own use and purposes. He, at, you know, at the end of my eight days of, or more than that, he actually came to America at one point and we had more sessions. He finally gave me access to his unpublished memoir. But I don't think he has any intention of publishing it. He, this is a man, actually, I should make very clear, who never accepted a dime of US money. He never signed a contract to be an agent. He was never under orders. 
But he had befriended Ames in Beirut in 1969. He was a successful Lebanese businessman, and he had his own financial resources. But he had spent a senior year in high school as an exchange student in Naperville, Illinois, and had fallen in love with America and all things Americans. And he just thought it was a damn shame that the US government didn't understand the Middle East and didn't understand the Palestinian question in particular. And so he took it upon himself to try to bring these parties together. And he was the man who actually had known Ali Hassan Salama uh, in his Cairo days, even before he joined Fatah and the PLO. And they were personal friends. And so he was the intermediary between Ames and Ali Hassan Salama. And he did this simply because he thought it was the right thing to do. So he was never, a, never an agent, although for 10 years he sort of acted as a virtual access agent, as it's called, a man who introduces the CIA clandestine officer to other sources. And even after Ames's death, he, um, which devastated him, he did, he courageously went back to the Middle East after uh, the CIA's station chief was kidnapped in 1985, and he, in very dangerous circumstances, risked his own life and almost was killed in a car bomb attack and to try to find a way to free the CIA officer. He's an extraordinary character, so, you know, but... Um, He's actually rather depressed and, and, and pessimistic these days about the future of the, the troubled neighborhood. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.